of our degrowth talk series. My name is Ollie, and I'm your host today. We've also got Kat who will be fielding some of your questions later on and Lorenzo, our tech wizard, helping us out. As you may already know, this series of talks has been organized by the team behind the UK degrowth summer school, originally planned for August this year in Leeds and Manchester, but sadly postponed for obvious reasons. If you're interested in taking part or learning more, you can find out all you need to know following the links in the description uh, below. Just before we get going, um, we wanted to make a comment of solidarity uh, with the Black Lives Matters um, activist movement and, uh, and allies all around the world. Uh, the structural racism uh, that has been uh, so tragically displayed in the most recent instances of, uh, of, of murder have been uh, have, have, have touched all of us and uh, we really would like to to share the comment made by the Vienna degrowth conference recently um, in solidarity with with the movement and our, our allies everywhere and you can find a link to to that uh, really powerful statement uh, again in the description today the title of today's panel is doing business in the degrowth economy from theory to practice the term business is an evocative one. When we talk about the business world, we can quickly conjure the sorts of images that many of us would be quick to shun. Skyscrapers full of men in suits, politicians lobbied behind closed doors, workers rendered dependent and powerless, communities alienated and silenced, nature recast as natural resources, pretty much the dogged pursuit of managerial mastery over all forms of life and, of course, the slick, an occasionally compelling sheen of marketing and PR that seeks to spin all of the above into something vaguely resembling a decent way of organizing society. For many, business is simply a dirty word. In this talk, we'll contend that it doesn't have to be. Across the world, and for quite some time now, new forms of business have been taking root, defying extractivism in favor of regeneration, embracing mutualism over competition, What's more, this approach to business is rapidly gaining in popularity as more and more people become growth agnostic and realize the deleterious effects that the fetishization of GDP has on people and planet. Even the Harvard Business Review has started paying attention with a very recent article urging the business world not to be afraid of degrowth and to see the value in adopting some of its principles. So we're joined today by some eminent theorists and practitioners of the spaces and paradigms that these businesses call home. And over the next 90 minutes or so, we'll be calling on our guests to trace the outline of a degrowth friendly world of business. Any questions uh, as they come up, please do ask away in the, in the chat, in the comments. And my co-host Kat will be on hand to pass them on when the time comes after all of our guests have given their opening presentations. Our first guest, Ashish Kotari, is an environmentalist from India specialized in biodiversity, environmental justice, and alternatives to dominant paradigms of development. He's the author of over 30 books with an academic career spanning the globe. Professionally, he has consulted on a range of government projects and is current, currently coordinates India's national biodiversity strategy, if I'm not mistaken. He has sat on the boards of several international NGOs, committees, and policy commissions, and is a former chair of Greenpeace India. Ashish has been active within a number of people's movements and currently helps run the global network for radical ecological democracy and the alternatives confluence, bringing together a range of actors from across India to work together on development alternatives. We're delighted to have you with us today, Ashish. Thank you for joining, uh, especially as it's rather late in the evening where you are now, as I understand. Thank you. Should I start with the... Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Ah, okay. I thought you were introducing all the speakers. Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, uh, Ali, and thank you all for uh, this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to uh, show a, a, a set of slides to uh, uh, with my presentation, but I just wanted to preface it by also saying that uh, this is not necessarily about degrowth, uh, as the degrowth movement in Europe uh, very well understands, because I've we have been in dialogue for a long time. Uh, it's not necessarily a term that applies to or applies well to the global south. Uh, but it is complementary to a whole lot of other worldviews or other ways of looking at, let's say, well-being, 
broadly spoken or post growth or post development uh, world views and i'll speak a little bit about that towards the end um so uh, i'm going to switch to slides uh, if you can let me know whether the share screen is working properly or not and essentially i wanted to talk about business is this working all right can you see the full slide yes okay great um yeah so essentially i wanted to talk about business in terms of work and livelihoods and i think it's very important that we distinguish livelihoods from jobs livelihoods are about ways of working ways of being ways of living with the earth ways of living with each other uh, whereas jobs in as in the modern sector are more about doing something that's other than leisure and and uh, culture and and so on so that's why people wait desperately for the weekend in the modern sector when it's when it comes to jobs whereas with livelihoods there's no such concept as weekdays and weekends and so on and i want to build on that when talking about business business as in being busy with work or doing work or doing livelihoods and in the in that uh, process also producing consuming exchanging and so on um just as a quick backdrop this is something that everybody is already familiar with so i won't go into detail but uh, from our vantage point in the global south and i guess also for the global north development in its dominant vision has essentially meant violence the destruction of the rest of nature the destruction of communities cultures uh, even ourselves as individual lives um and what the covid crisis has done is to present us at least two broad paths for the future we either it's it has become an excuse for authoritarianism and profit making as we see across the world for instance in in the jump in profits of amazon and so on and so forth or the ways in which the uh, nation states have clamped down with lockdowns and all kinds of other authoritarian uh, measures especially in india we see that uh, or we can take another path using the opportunity of this crisis um to look for fundamental shifts in the way we relate to the rest of nature and to each other and in that also a fundamental shift in the way we do business if we want to do that fundamental shift we have to ask ourselves this question what is it we're up against it's not just about greening the economy or greening growth or sustainable development etc it's really about being able to challenge the fundamental structures of uh, oppression of uh, the concentration of power in many different ways so uh, i want to talk now about i mean give you a few examples of where this kind of uh, challenge to the structures of oppression and unsustainability are taking place we have been documenting alternative initiatives in india especially or across south asia for the last many years we have several hundred examples of this and i'm going to give a few just a few a sample of these to show what it means to uh challenge capitalism statism patriarchy and so on uh while at the same time meeting basic needs and meeting aspirations of people my first example is of 3000 dalit women farmers in uh, southern india now those of you who know the indian caste system know that dalits are the most oppressed section of society so called untouchables as women in a patriarchal society also they are oppressed and so on in the last 30 years these women have created an agricultural revolution and moved from a situation of food scarcity and deprivation to one of food sovereignty which means complete control over their uh, over their seeds over the land over the water over the knowledge relating to food they also created a sustainable business uh, by making a producer company uh, and a, or a producer cooperative But what's very interesting and important about this business is that it's not about profits first it's actually not about profits at all it is uh, based on the ethics of what can be sustained within the earth uh, within the ethics of uh, looking at seeds and the earth as as uh, spiritual beings and as sacred and also within the ethics of self reliance so first domestic self reliance and sufficiency and then putting things into the market uh, another example of a producer company also from the south is uh, is dharni uh, by something called the timbuktu collective and this one is very interesting because it is based on the fundamental principles of democratic functioning uh, all the work all the farmers in this uh, are part of decision making and benefits are equitably distributed rather than being 
captured by one capitalist owner. We see similar things happening in cities, trying to create uh, or trying to do away with a kind of parasitic relationship between the city and the village uh, to create more equitable relations between, say, the farmer producers or the crafts producers and the consumers in cities, and actually even creating conditions for agriculture and crafts and so on in the urban environment. Uh, non-profit shops, um, social uh, solidarity um, uh, markets, and so on and so forth. Um, going up into the Himalaya, it's very interesting. Uh, one sees women's movements of various kinds. This one, for instance, was a women's movement that started off against domestic violence and moved quickly into how do women become economically independent uh, with two major kinds of businesses. One, their traditional craft, uh, the making of products of, out of sheep, wool, and so on. And the second, in the more modern sector, uh, community-based or community-led ecotourism for people who are coming and wanting to enjoy nature there or learn about village culture, eat the local food, and so on and so forth. Um, you then, actually, if you're talking about crafts, we can move into uh, Western India, where there's been an incredible revival of handloom weaving based on organic cotton. And what is very interesting about this is that young men who had gone out to work in industries and so on have come back into this traditional craft. And their narrative is not just about the fact that there is good economy here, but even more importantly, that they are with their family, they are doing creative work, they are not subject to some boss, they can work at their own time, and they're carrying on, carrying on their traditional community heritage. And even young women have come into handloom weaving, which was not the case earlier. So we're seeing gender transformations also taking place as a result of this. Um, then we go into looking at uh, manufacturers. So there's a number of places in India and South Asia where in rural areas or in small towns, small scale manufacturing is being done through cooperative uh, mechanisms or through com uh, producer companies. And the concept of a network economy, which is to say that 20 villages, 30 villages together, could be self-reliant or self-sufficient, at least for all their basic needs, food, water, energy, housing, health, education, etc. And there's a village in uh, Western India called Kunaria, for instance, which has decided as a result of COVID, because with COVID, they are, everybody is realizing the importance of localization and of local self-reliance. So they've decided that the 44 million rupees that they spend every month on household goods like soap and so on and so forth, why not produce everything in that cluster of villages rather than make uh, rather than enable corporations to make the profits uh, out of those products? Um, we have also a number of social enterprises, which are of course uh, into revenues, but more important than the revenues is the social orientation or the ecological orientation. For instance, on in energy, uh, biomass-based energy or solar-based energy, decentralized local community controlled, renewable, clean, etc. Uh, this is the only example I'm giving from outside India because to me it's also inspiring that even large scale manufacturing, such as this factory producing olive oil based uh, detergents in Greece can be democratically controlled. They don't have to have a capitalist owner or even a government owner. So these are 30, 40 workers who, who run that factory on a completely democratic basis. There's no boss and everybody gets the same pay for every hour of work. Now, these are revolutionary ideas that, that uh, are already out there from which we can learn. Even the renewal of barter, so doing away, not doing away, but at least reducing the impact of centralized monetary systems is also part of this new form of business, or in some cases, old form of business that's coming back, such as barter, uh, product for product rather than money. And this is uh, now in many parts of India, uh, this, this organization called Goonj is using cloth, a basic need that's usually forgotten, but clothes and cloth as a means for creating barter, for people to do self-help with building bridges or uh, creating roads or whatever it is uh, in exchange for proper clothing and then beginning to exchange also with each other. Oh, sorry, I did have some examples from other parts of the world. So these are some that I've been to in Europe. Um, Time banking, for instance, again, as a means of getting away from the centralization of uh, money. Alternative currencies, such as in, in uh, uh, Luxembourg, non-profit cafes run by young people. I often tell young people in, in India who are in urban uh, situations in cities who don't necessarily want to go back into agriculture or pastoralism or crafts, 
that there's a whole bunch of things you can do in the city or as modern educated youth, nonprofit cafes, open source uh, technologies and so on and so forth. I think my uh, fellow speakers will speak more about that. Two very important things with, with all of this is one, that if this kind of thing has to happen, then communities need to be in control of the resources, the nature, the ecosystems, and the knowledge that they need for creating these kinds of businesses or, or continuing them. This is an example of 90 villages that have formed a federation of village assemblies in central India and claim that the entire territory that they uh, are living in should be self-managed, self-governed, territorial independence, which does not mean that they're saying we don't believe in the Indian constitution, but that in fact, the Indian constitution spirit is really about self-governance and self-rule. And this includes taking over the forests and doing sustainable business with forest produce, while also keeping in mind the need for wildlife and biodiversity to survive. Second, crucially, that technologies have to be democratically controlled. You can't have so-called expert institutions or corporations controlling technologies. Most technological innovation across the world for the last several thousand years has happened by ordinary people, um, not by so-called uh, experts sitting in institutions. And that has to be recaptured. We have to be able to create the possibilities for this kind of flourishing of technological innovation uh, through democratic means by so-called ordinary people. And these are some examples of that. So I'm gonna uh, end in the last three or four slides with sort of trying to build a bigger, bigger picture based on these examples. And these are just a few of hundreds of examples that we have. We call it here uh, Eco Swaraj. The term Swaraj is a very, very important one. It's kind of complementary to degrowth, but also different. It talks about Swaraj, Ubuntu, Boen Viver, et cetera, are about a way of living that is self-restrained, that has me, my rights, my community's rights, my community's autonomy and freedom, but in responsibility to your freedom, your autonomy, your um, rights. Um, so it's a very deep fundamental concept. It's much deeper than the Western notion of democracy. It really is about uh, autonomy, responsibility, solidarity, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so all of these examples and many others are saying, we basically are talking about in that sense, a Swaraj, a radical ecological democracy in which we are all part of decision-making, but we are also responsible to the rest of the earth and to other people. And we can think of this in five spheres. I won't go into this in detail. But if you take the uh, top right hand one, uh, the, those 90 villages are saying democracy is about us being the first unit of decision making and especially things that affect our lives. We should be central to decision making, not politicians who we elect and not corporations and so on. The second circle there is economic democracy, where, uh, for instance, the Viome factory in uh, Greece or the Tech and Development Society women saying, Whatever is necessary for production and consumption should be in our hands, not in the hands of capitalists and the state. The third is very important because in a, in a country like India, we have hundreds of years of injustice and inequality in gender and caste and so on. And across the world, you have these. You have to also then uh, include struggle, struggles for social justice as part of this. Similarly, then fourth one is culture. The examples I've given are also culturally rooted, even as they're open to the cultures of all the worlds. Like Gandhi said very clearly, he said, the windows and the doors of my house are open to the winds of all cultures to flow through and I will learn from them. But I refuse to be blown off my feet by any of those winds. So you're rooted, but you're also open. So it's open localization in many ways. And finally, of course, the fifth sphere is about ecological resilience. So which means that all businesses need to respect ecological limits, which includes then also respecting the rights of other species. Um, and this is my most important slide, and I'm just going to put it up there without obviously going into any detail, which is that business has to be based on a set of ethics, ethical principles. Um, this includes solidarity and collectives rather than individualism and competition. It includes rights, but with responsibilities. It includes the dignity of labor, physical labor. Why should somebody who does mental work get more pay than somebody who does physical work? It includes simplicity, it, it includes non-violence, the rights of other species and so on. Uh, like I said, I'm just put this up there and maybe in the discussion we can have uh, uh, more on, on some of these values. And I'm sure uh, my co-speakers will also add to these. 
So the last uh, couple of points, um, what's I think very important to realize is that across the world, there are these hundreds and thousands of initiatives that are actually pointing to very radical alternatives to the currently dominant system, the dominant economy, the dominant polity. Very, very important is for us to be able to work together, to weave these different alternatives together horizontally, non-hierarchically, learning from each other across cultures, ac across geographies, and to create economies and polities that actually respect all life and that respect each other and are based on solidarity and love and so on. So we have re recently initiated something called the Global Tapestry of Alternatives for this kind of weaving. We also came out with a book uh, last year called Pluriverse, which has more than 100 examples from around the world of this kind of alternative, radical uh, uh, ways of living, ways of being, ways of doing things, including ways of doing business. Thank you very much. Ashish, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, really broad ranging uh, presentation there with a, a really fantastic spread of, of examples um, that uh, the degrowth is very much compatible with business uh, all over the world. Um, moving, uh, moving on now to our, to our second speaker, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Juliet Shaw. Juliet is a professor of sociology at Boston College in the US, where her research is focused on consumption, time use, and environmental sustainability. Formerly a professor at Harvard, her long and distinguished career has also featured spells at several prestigious research institutions, and her work in expanding the frontiers of economic thought has been recognized with several awards. Her New York Times best-selling book, The Overworked American in the early 90s, has since been followed by a litany of publications exploring changing patterns of labor, taking in powerful critiques of consumerism and free market ideology along the way, with her most recent book making her even more of a very welcome presence on our panel today, Sustainable Lifestyles and the Quest for Plenitude, Case Studies of the New Economy. Julia, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Please take it away. Thank you. And it's a great pleasure to be here and an honor to uh, follow Ashish Kotari. Um, I, I want to thank Oliver for that initial statement about what's going on in the United States. It's you know hard to be in a gathering like this without uh, acknowledging it, a very painful time. Um, we can only hope that it, it, it brings our country uh, in, a, in a better direction in terms of racism and the treatment of black Americans. Um, and it has been uh, in some ways very inspiring to see the tremendous outpouring of not just blacks, but um, people, uh, whites, uh, other, other uh, Asians, uh, Americans, uh, Latinx, et cetera, um, who are expressing their um, dissatisfaction, anger, um, and demands for uh, change in this country uh, centered on police violence and treatment of blacks, but also much broader dissatisfaction with the decay of democracy, the um, extreme inequality, um, the unraveling of um, well-being for large numbers of people. So it's, it's really great to be able to talk about these issues of, of new economy, alternative economy, degrowth, et cetera. Um, because especially at this time, it's really important that we have these alternatives to point to as the direction that our societies must move in. And that's, you know, that's for people all around the world. So I, I wanted to talk to you about one very particular alternative that I've been studying. Um, it's called the Platform Cooperative. So it is a, a, kind, the one, a, a kind of institution similar to what uh, Ashish Kothari was just talking about. So alternative principles of economic organization, uh, democratic governance, et cetera. Um, I, be, I, I uh, undertook this study in the context of a larger study uh, coming out of the Great uh, Recession and the financial collapse of 2008 
uh, looking at new economic alternatives that were emerging in the United States. And, and uh, the US is not the only place this was happening, obviously. Um, but some of the kinds of things that Ashish Kotari was just talking about, we studied the time bank and makerspace, barter economies and so forth. And most of those were what we might call low tech, uh, although some of them had high tech aspects. Um, the platform cooperative is really uh, coming from uh, taking some of the technological innovations that we've seen in for-profit platforms like Airbnb or ride hailing apps and so forth, and thinking about how some of that technological innovation might work uh, in a very different context that's oriented to people's uh, needs and so forth. So let me just um, share my screen here. And um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, a company called Stocksy, which is a, uh, a company that sells what's called stock photography. So photographers create images, they put them into an image bank and they are uh, sold to customers. And this is an online uh, enterprise. So first, just a point about co-ops and what I, why, I, why I love cooperatives. Um, first of all, they bring democracy to the economy. And without a democratic economy, you can't have a fair economy, you can't have ecological sustainability. I mean, one of the key points of work by people like Eleanor Ostrom and others is the, the importance of democratic structures for getting uh, ecologically sustainable outcomes over long periods of time. You can't have political democracy without economic democracy. And I would say, and this may be a surprise for those of you who have studied conventional economics, but you can't get a truly efficient system. The efficiencies of capitalism are partly a mirage. It's good at some kinds of innovation, but it has many, many uncounted uh, costs and resources. So it's not a truly efficient system. In fact, it's one that's bringing us to the brink of ecocide. So, uh, um, so uh, traditional worker co-ops are Good, they're wonderful. Um, India, of course, is a place that has a rich and long history and many worker co-ops. In the United States, they've been a lot more difficult to establish. Uh, this is also true in relationship to Europe, for example, where we have famous regions like the Mondragon uh, area of, of, of uh, the Basque country in Spain, which has a, a deep, long cooperative history. But in the US, despite all the enthusiasm that we've had over the past 10 years for, for co-ops, we, we, we don't even have 400 worker co-ops in this entire country today. And the numbers of jobs they've created have been small. There was a very popular effort um, in the city of Cleveland, which had enormous uh, person power and money, millions and millions of dollars uh, poured into it to create cooperatives, and yet, seven years into that, uh, it had only generated fewer than 150 jobs. So one of the things that we see in the United States is the difficulty of really getting scale up of, of traditional worker co-ops. Platform co-ops are a different story though. Uh, they can scale very rapidly if they are done well. They take advantage of sophisticated digital technology, um, people who are advocating for them would argue they have the potential to scale much more rapidly with low barriers to entry and low transactions cost. And they can make things very uh, attractive for individual workers uh, who can get along without an agent, a boss or a corporate employer and redirect value from middlemen to worker and consumer. Of course, one of the things about platform co-ops as you'll see is that they work for people who are, are working individually. So for, you know, in agricultural settings where people have to work together or factory set manufacturing, less, less uh, relevant, but in the, the very large service sector of the United States, they hold, I think, a lot of promise. So I did what I believe is the first academic study of a platform cooperative. Uh, it's, it's a stock photography cooperative called Stocksy United. The company gave us access to members. We were able to do interviews. They also gave us uh, internal data on their revenues. 
Um, we did not have access to their forums, which are the governmental uh, area, uh, governmental where they do the governance um, for privacy reasons. And also I should say the company had no control over what we found, what we report, and they allowed us to identify them publicly. So this is my research team, uh, graduate students in sociology, uh, almost all of whom have now finished their PhDs. Samantha Eddy, who's in red, did this particular case, but these other students worked on the other cases that I've mentioned. This uh, was an eight year project. So uh, here are some of the pictures from that Stocksy uh, sells. Um, it was founded in 2013 by two very experienced entrepreneurs who'd already sort of done something innovative in the stock photography realm. They sold out to the sort of the Amazon of stock photography. Um, and when their, after the company was acquired, the photographers began getting very unhappy about working for this predatory company, Getty. And so the two founders uh, decided to start an alternative, which was a co-op. Uh, they gave a loan, which was very important. So it started very well capitalized and with a lot of industry experience. And they pretty quickly uh, got about a thousand photographers uh, to join. Very competitive to get in. Uh, the original accept rate was about 6% and it includes people from all over the world. So it has been a tremendous success financially. It gives a much larger fraction of the uh, revenues to the workers, uh, the artists. Um, in general, artists would get about 20% of, of what a customer pays. They're, these artists are getting more than 50. Uh, our interviews found that people were very happy. There's tremendous demand uh, to join the co-op. Um, they appreciate the flexibility. But I will, uh, I do want to turn now, so it, in, in some sense, a phenomenal success, something that we should try and establish many more of, and I believe strongly in platform co-ops. I thought it might be interesting to talk about some of the challenges that this cooperative has faced. Um, and some of these are things that we found in some of the other research that we've done. Um, the, on the governance side, you know, the lack of a physical space, um, is difficult and sort of creating a common culture is much harder on a global platform or even a non-global platform than it is if workers are sharing a physical space or location. But there, there's another set of challenges that have to do with uh, the nature of platforms, um, which is uh, that people come to them with different orientations. And we found um, two, two cleavages among the group. One is people who think about the work as an art versus a business. Um, not all the artists care about selling. They do the art because they uh, appreciate the artistic expression. And some of the other commercially oriented artists are frustrated by the way that the, the uh, site has been set up. So what the artistic group loves, which is freedom from the tyranny of clients, the commercial group found, finds somewhat frustrating. What artistic types resent, which is rejection from editors when they try and add photos to the, they have, their photos have to be accepted um, because they won't be commercial, the commercial folks appreciate. And there's a similar uh, divide between what we would, might call hobbyists or professionals um, and this is true on many of the platforms that we studied, people who do it as a sort of supplement to their daily lives versus people who depend on the platform for their livelihoods. I think many of the initiatives that Ashish talked about are uh, involve people's full-time livelihoods. Um, and when you have that commonality, it's, it is easier in some ways because they're, they ha will ha have a, a, a common orientation to the work. When you have people who do this, you know, very much as just a, a side thing or a little bit of extra money on the side versus people who depend for their livelihoods, you can get real uh, differences. Um, 
and in part, this led to a, a kind of winner-take-all market situation. So this is a graph of the revenue distribution. I'll, I'll give you, it's because it's a little bit hard to read the numbers, I'll give them to you here. But it's a very, very highly skewed revenue distribution. In fact, more unequal than the US wealth distribution, which is famously unequal. Um, a, a mere nine contributors earn over a quarter of the revenue because they are very, uh, commercially oriented professionals. They put a lot of money into their shoots and they get a lot out. Um, and uh, the top 87 out of the thousand earn two thirds of the income. So that's something that in a, a, in a platform co-op where people are individual contributors, uh, you're gonna get a, a much more unequal distribution of income than the kinds of efforts that Ashish was talking about where in some cases, like the Greek factory that he talked, everyone's getting an equal wage. And how you develop a culture of uh, solidarity and common governance where you have those big income dis distinctions is, is, a, is a challenge. Um, and I've explained that inequality of incomes a little bit. One other thing about them that's interesting, and this speaks to the cooperative dimension, is that this uh, stock photography is kind of low end photography and most you know sort of successful artistic photographers would never give their work to a to a, a stock company but because it was a cooperative and people believed in the concept of cooperative they have some highly talented very successful artistic photographers who can earn a, a tremendous amount of money so that's partly Partly also, you know, I, I call them here super talents. Um, there's another thing about co-ops in general, uh, which we have to remember, which is in order to be successful, to some extent, they are subject to what I'll call the tyranny of the market. Now, Stocksy has been an innovator in the market, so they've had a little bit of, of power to change the market. But if you are a weaving cooperative or an olive oil cooperative or a cooperative in Mondragon facing a large consumer market, to some extent you have to meet that market. And so the ability of the co-op to sort of create the world that it wants is limited by that. What we found in this co-op was a kind of cultural tyranny in which the consumers wanted sort of Western lifestyle pictures of white rich people, what we call the kind of neo-colonial or neo-imperialist demand structure. Um, non-Western scenes that were taken by the photographers were labeled as travel. So that, that's an example of, of some of the kinds of uh, challenges that, that a, uh, an individual co-op will face. Uh, last point I wanna make uh, is, is just about participation. So out of the thousand members, about two to 300 participate. We found a few people who didn't even realize it was a co-op or what that meant. Not everyone cares to spend their time doing this. It's harder on a digital platform to create a culture of participation, different time zones, minimal offline co co connection, diversity of participants. But I would also say that in many of the larger co-ops in North America, this is actually not a bad fraction of participation. Once you get kind of size, uh, you don't necessarily have that sort of 100% participation that you would have in the smaller co-ops. So finally, uh, the model I think is undeniably successful on multiple dimensions, on artistic satisfaction, revenue growth, there are tensions, um, but I think it tells us that this model is feasible. For us, one question is the elite status of Stocksy. This is a high talent level, high aesthetic positioning. Uh, can platform co-ops work well for low wage workers? And uh, the answer to that, I think, is that we are starting to see that it looks feasible. Um, there is a growing movement in this country and around the world to create more platform co-ops, particularly in the service sector. And um, I think financing is probably the biggest obstacle um, but I think we're going to see more and more of these and the more we can learn about them in order to foster this new um, kind of economic form that uh, hopes to deliver uh, good incomes, uh, work autonomy and democracy and governance. Um, I think 
the more we can understand about it, the better. So thank you. And yeah. Thank you so much for that, Juliet. Uh, yeah, I was really interested to to go a little deeper there into into Stocksy. I had I had heard of it, um, but uh, nowhere near in that amount of detail. Really interesting as well, specifically this uh, this inequality of of income there that you uh, that you explained for us. I guess that might be uh, unexpected, but certainly um, yeah, flagging those those challenges to building a culture of solidarity and governance there. Um, hopefully, something we can uh, we can dwell on with our next speaker, who I will now uh, swiftly introduce. Uh, so Oliver Sylvester Bradley is our third and final speaker. Ollie is a co-founder of the Open Co-op, the Open Credit Network, co-inventor of the Murmurations Protocol for the Cooperative Economy, founder of ethical job site Elevator Cafe, also founder of the campaign group Economic Rebellion, and a seasoned expert in marketing and communications for the renewable energy sector. He joins us today from London, where he is currently preparing to host the fourth edition, I think, of the Open Co-op Conference, this year making the most of the online format, for obvious reasons, and bringing together some of the best minds in alternative economics for what sounds like an intensively interactive two-day program on the 11th and 12th of this month, exploring how we can all collaborate better to network the commons. Ollie, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time out of your pretty packed schedule by the sounds of it. Um, I, rather than, uh, as with our other speakers, doing a presentation, um, I wondered if I could really just sort of ask you a few questions and have you guide us through some of the, some of your experience in, in the platform co-op sector in the UK. Um, and then moving on uh, as well later on to, to some of your work with, uh, with mutual credit, such as the, uh, the Open Credit Network. Um, obviously, Juliet's done a fantastic job of giving us a real overview of what platform co-ops are and you know, how they differ from co-ops in general. I wonder if you had anything really to add in a contrastive sense, looking specifically at the UK sector, are there any sort of, you know, uh, key differences that pull out or is there actually, uh, you know, a great deal of similarity between the way they exist in the US and the UK? Thanks, Oli, yeah, good question. And I will come to that. I just wanted to say thanks to Juliet for, yeah, really covering good ground there on what platform co-ops are and Ashish as well for all those case studies from India. It was really exciting to see. And I think they're all integral parts of a, of a degrowth society. Um, I think that, yeah, the, the focus on platform co-ops here is really exciting. It's a, a model that we've been promoting here in the UK, largely inspired by the work that's happening in America for the last four or five years, because we really see platform co-ops as a blueprint for a new kind of business, which is not designed for growth. But just before I touch on your question about the differences in the UK, I wanted to just take a step back because we've heard a lot about co-ops here. Um, but I think it's important to actually define what a cooperative is. And there's a very succinct and quite wordy definition, but I'm going to read it out anyway. It defines a co-op as an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. So I think that that's important in that a co-op is not a business. It's never put together as a business. It might become a business, but ultimately a co-op is just a group of people coming together to decide to do something because they can all benefit from everybody else's involvement and that they work together to make that happen. So when you take that to the platform level, it becomes even more interesting because the fundamental nature of a co-op is to serve its members. It's not to serve society or to make money or to pay back venture capital investors. Its primary purpose is to, yes, yeah, satisfy its members. And so that might happen just, for example, we have in the UK here lots of allotment associations, which are cooperatives. They're just groups of people growing stuff together and there's no business at all. And I think it's important to point out as well that you can have a co-op, anyone like us here could form a co-op right now by just deciding amongst ourselves, holding our hands up and voting, yes, let's found a co-op. The other thing that we would have to do is agree to the cooperative principles of which there are seven. And we heard from Ashish and Julia about the importance of principles, which again, I see as a fundamental part of a degrowth economy. So co-ops are wrapped up with this democratic member control and, um, and follow the seven cooperative principles. 
And when you take that to the platform level, as Juliet says, in order to try and achieve scale, then some very interesting things can happen, especially using the technologies of the internet that we see today. They're not a kind of magic bullet because they won't solve all situations. And in fact, a lot of platform co-ops really struggle because they can't get the venture capital that most platform businesses use to bring them to scale to then dominate markets and suck as much cash as they can out in the standard kind of demo, um, capitalist model. But once they do get established, then they are better. They benefit everybody who's involved better than any other sort of business really. Um, and the planet too, most importantly, because I think as Julia alluded to, conventional capital business, capitalist business is very good at measuring its progress in terms of GDP. But what we don't see on those balance sheets are the externalities which are pumped out, all of the costs associated with environmental pollution, which is what is destroying our planet today, land on the planet and the taxpayer and everybody else to try and clean up afterwards. So we don't really, when we see conventional business, see the true costs. And in a kind of degrowth or steady state society, hopefully those costs would have become internalized and actually dealt with properly. And platform co-ops even make some effort to do that in that they're much more transparent in the way that they account, the way that they report and the way that they pay their, uh, their workers. So to come back to your question, are there differences in the UK? I don't think so necessarily. We have um, some, some interesting examples. I would have brought up Stuxy as an example. Another UK based uh, platform co-op is called Equal Care and their website is equalcare.com. Um, they came to one of our original, uh, the founders that came to one of our original platform co-op conferences and were very inspired by what they heard found uh, somebody who was experienced there to sit on their board and have set up basically a, a care worker co-op whereby they have four different classes of members. So they have the people who actually run the organization and sit in the middle and run the platform. They have the investors, and then they have the people that need care and the people that provide care. And together those four member classes own the entire organization and therefore get to set amongst themselves how much they charge each other for uh, care work and um, yeah, how much people are paid and what sort of return the investors make. And I think, you know, COVID-19 uh, is um, hopefully, you know, pointing to the need for, uh, for, well, if it hasn't been pointed to already relentlessly over the years for the need to, for reform in the care sector. And I, I think, you know, equal care is an example and a few of it's, um, you know, in the same field could you know really light up a, a really a, a just way of, of, of organizing such a such a crucial sector um you mentioned you know the the the, the challenges that the platform co-ops and indeed i suppose co-ops at large will face when they are you know for want of a better word competing on the market because they're competitors they, they simply can't and i've heard you describe this before as uh, the capital conundrum um you know and i wonder if we if we sort of have a vision of this uh of this degrowth economy featuring all different you know a, a colorful tapestry of different kinds of business of which platform co-ops and co-ops in general uh are, are, are a crucial cornerstone how do we get through that where, do, where does the money come from to actually finance the establishment of these of these platform co-ops how do we solve the the, uh, the capital conundrum, if there could be such a million dollar question, literally. <laughs> it's a brilliant question, yeah, and not one that there is an easy answer to. Um, to my mind, the best answer comes from more collaboration. So if you think about uh, an existing platform co-op, take for example, Equal Care again, if they were to onboard thousands of members, even hundreds of thousands of members, then you have a group of people that are united by their common values, unlike the customers in a conventional business. And then if, say, in one of the same key areas that Equal Care were providing services, you wanted to found another platform co-op, for example, a bicycle delivery co-op that could deliver food to people, there should be a way of passing over those customers that are willing from one platform co-op to another, thereby skirting around the need for venture capital at the point of foundation. So 
most venture capital money in most startup businesses is spent on customer acquisition costs. Uber have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars effectively buying customers by subsidizing the cost of a ride in order to undercut the conventional taxi providers. So it's no good trying to fight in those terms. We will never, even if we crowdfunded all the money in the world from all the winning people in order to start up more platform co-ops, we still wouldn't be able to buy customers as effectively as a capitalist business. So we need a different model. And to my mind, that has to be something around data sharing between organizations that are willing to cross promote each other and to fertilize each other's new and burgeoning businesses. I think there's probably an answer there as well in terms of some sort of token economics, which gets around the need for uh, major venture capital by incentivizing early uh, adopters to come on board and join these services in return, and even to finance them, in return for a greater degree of the payback later down the line. And by that, I don't kind of mean the standard venture capitalist model, you put in all the cash at the front, you take it out. I mean, m something much more like an ethical investment in which you would put in a small amount of money, which would get converted into tokens or some other currency form, which could be then used to pay staff and would eventually, in the same way as a bond, uh, deliver you back your capital over the long term. Oh, we can't hear you, Ollie. Beg your pardon, sorry. I was gonna say, yeah, that's, uh, I think this idea of collaboration and a, and a, and a high tech or data focused uh, solution there is really promising. And hopefully that's the kind of conversation that goes on at this, uh, this conference. I know um, you're, uh, you're excitedly planning for at the moment. I wonder if this is an interesting segue here to, to bring in uh, the role of money in general. We, you, you speak about token economics as a potential way to uh, help fund a new generation of, uh, of successful platform co-ops. But there is, you know, we, we can't shy away from the fact there is, there is a, 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 quite, a quite a rotten sort of problem with money itself um, in, its, in its sort of fiat conception at the moment. I, I wonder, uh, I, I know your involvement with the Open Credit Network, for instance, has, has tried to pioneer solutions to that in the UK, but mutual credit, of which Open Credit Network is, a, is, uh, is one instance, uh, seems to promise quite a lot from the solidarity uh, and uh, I wonder if you could say, is there, you know, is there a link, do you think, but first of all, perhaps the definition of what mutual credit is um, and then how, you know, what, what kind of services it can provide. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It, great to pick that up. I mean, because I think, you know, we've all touched on it here, but there is a fundamental problem in our economy in that the money that we have and the money that we use to transact via BACs and SWIFT and all our cashless payments that we do with our cards everywhere this fiat-based money is created as interest-bearing debt. And because of its very nature, the way that it is created by central and investment banks, it demands growth. It fundamentally builds in the growth imperative into our economy from the word go. So until we change the way that money is made, we're never going to really change anything else. We can you know, go around shopping with platform co-ops, and our money will be entering hopefully a more regenerative and fair and sustainable economy, and maybe one that isn't predicated on growth. But whilst money is still created in that way and used in other businesses outside of the regenerative economy, in the conventional extractive economy, we will still be forced to deliver growth. Um, when, for example, money is created as a, a mortgage, so that's a prime example of the way that money is created as interest-bearing debt, somebody goes to buy a house, they go to their bank manager, say, can I borrow this million dollars? Bank manager then says yes, checks their, their house might be worth that if they go bust and can't pay their mortgage and want to get it back. And they create that money in a computer at the flick of a button, and the money gets wired over and the house gets bought. But over the period of time that the person pays for the house, they have to pay back probably nigh on $2 million. And thereby more money was created within the economy, which then has to be paid back. And equally other businesses, so conventional public limited companies um, 
have a growth imperative built in. They exist to satisfy their shareholders and those shareholders want to see growth year on year. So while we still keep playing that game, no matter how ethical and equitable and democratic we make our individual businesses, I firmly believe that we will still have all of the environmental problems that we have today. So what are the alternatives? Well, that's why I set up, along with my colleagues, the website economicrebellion.org, which is designed to point out three R's. The first one being remember, and that is to remember what Buckminster Fuller taught us, that in order to make a system obsolete, the best thing that you can do is to design a new system, which puts the old one out of business. So we can go around complaining and campaigning to our uh, governments going, oh, let's not use GDP as a measure of growth anymore. Or, hey, let's clean up the environment. Wouldn't that be nice? Let's have a zero carbon economy. But they're not incentivized to do that. And that's not actually going to get us there. The best thing that we could do in order to uh, create a system which is more sustainable is to try and design one which makes the present system obsolete. So that's the first R is asking people to remember what Buckminster Fuller taught us. The second one um, is to react, to, uh, to understand that the uh, environmental crisis is primarily an economic crisis, that the way that money is created is causing the fundamental problems within our society. Um, and then if, you, if you've remembered those things and you've, you've understood, then the next logical conclusion is to react, is to actually get on board and to do something positive, which is going to try and create systemic change. And that's where solutions like mutual credit come in. So we heard from Ashish earlier about barter. And barter is obviously one of the, the first sort of means of transaction that humanity ever used, trading one thing for another. But barter is quite limited because if the thing that I have is not the thing that you want, then we can't do a bilateral transaction. We would have to go and find Juliet for me to give her something and then her to give you something. It gets a bit complicated and hence why money got created and things like commodity money, like shells and tobacco were originally used as a means of exchange. What mutual credit does is to replace that means of exchange with trust. So this sounds quite radical in, a, uh, in an economy that is entirely built on not trusting anybody um, placing all of our faith in the government to support these banks and keep bailing them out. Um, but it's not actually as radical as it seems. Basically, to join and use a mutual credit network, all you need to do is just sign up and tell the network your uh, information about your business or yourself, and also tell the system, what are you providing? What are your offers to the market? And what are your wants? What do you actually need? So you would join and list both these two sets of things. Um, and then the system would, the network would match you up with people who have what you want and want what you need, and it instantly provide you with new suggestions for suppliers and customers. Then on the back of that, if you find somebody that you want to trade with, you also get access to an interest-free line of credit. So meaning just like your bank overdraft, you could go into the red. And this means that before you've even earned anything by selling your goods or services, you can then go and buy something from someone else in the market. So to a small business, for example, who was possibly going to suffer cash flow problems because of a COVID induced economic crisis, this could be a really radical opportunity to ease the cash flow within your business to avoid paying probably 10 or 15 percent interest to a bank for giving you a loan or to avoid paying 17, 18% interest to a credit card company for spending your cash that way, or up to 49% APR to companies like Iwaka, who issue loans to small businesses here in the UK. So thereby allowing you to transact with other businesses in a much more fair, equitable, and sustainable way, which isn't gonna cost you so much money, and is ultimately, hopefully, going to go some way, even a little way, towards changing the way that money is created and trying to solve some of these systemic problems. Yeah, thank you, Oli, for that. I mean, it's it's kind of serendipitous now, actually. We've had, you know, we've heard from Ashish giving the, a, a, that range of, of the options that exist, kind of focusing in on the platform co-op option as a, as a, as a very... Uh, 
uh, you know, a great example of a kind of degrowth friendly kind of business. And then, you know, that begs a lot of questions, though, about how these businesses can can sort of trade with one another. Uh, you know, a big part of that business, a big part of the world of business is, of course, you know, B2B trade. So mutual credit as a degrowth uh, business service in that way, um, that, that really that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I wonder if, uh, thank you for that, Oli. If we can wrap up that, that conversation there, I wanted to, to pass over to Ashish. As I, as I understand, uh, in Pune, just south of Mumbai, where, where Ashish currently is, they've had a power cut. So I don't know if Ashish, you're, you're still in the dark, but apparently you can still hear us. So I wondered if you had um, uh, any, any, any comments on, uh, on Ollie's, and then we'll go to Juliet and make sure that everyone's had a chance to, to comment. We'll try and keep this to to uh, 10 to 15 minutes if possible in total for everyone. So we've got quite a lot of questions coming through on the chat that I'm sure uh, that I'm sure you'd love to to get to. So yeah, Ashish, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Great, yes. <laughs> okay. yes I uh, yeah, I'm physically in the dark, but hopefully not mentally. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm running on battery. So if I suddenly go off, you know what's happened. Um, yeah, just a couple of quick comments on I me. Mean, sort of comments slash questions uh, to Juliet and, and both of them, uh, uh, both Juliet and Oliver, Oliver, thanks a lot. I've actually learned quite a lot because this is not an area that I work on. So thanks for that. Uh, to Juliet, one of the, uh, I mean, quite clearly um, the importance of place-based economic transactions uh, is so visibly demonstrated by the problems with uh, the platform economy. But of course, we know that the platform economy is some of the platform cooperatives is something that is needed in a lot of the modern sector, uh, given the individualization that's happened in many of the modern uh, occupations. Uh, question is, instead of a thousand people, would much smaller platform co-ops be able to perform much better in terms of more democratic functioning, more the possibility of meeting together? So instead of having a thousand people spread across 65 countries, could that be split into, I don't know, 10 of 100 each, which are much more closer to each other physically also. So maybe once in a couple of years, they meet together. There's a greater possibility even of online uh, chatting and so on to be able to, to get to know each other better and to create more solidarity, uh, even discuss things like the inequalities that you mentioned, et cetera. So that's a question. I don't know whether that's possible or not. Um, and, been, uh, and for... Uh, for Oliver, I mean, just to give an example of, I think, what you were talking about in terms of the mutual credit. So one of the things that happened with the COVID crisis, the lockdown that the Indian government imposed was that people were left with produce that they could not sell in the market. In the normal markets were not available. They couldn't transport it, etc. One of the things that was done through a network that we helped to create is that uh, consumers uh, sent in money by bank in advance of actually getting the produce. So for instance, honey, five tons of honey was produced in Southern India, uh, which they could not sell by the, in the normal course of events, but they created a, a online platform in which hundreds of consumers were reached. And each of these consumers were able to send in, send in hundred rupees or a thousand rupees or whatever. The honey is still lying with the producers because obviously you can't transport it, but with the promise that it will be transported as soon as the lockdown is lifted. In a sense, this is probably uh, kind of an example of a, of a mutual credit system. And, and these are without uh, uh, interest, the interest-free uh, purchases uh, based on trust. So maybe that's an example of the kind that has worked in this current crisis and that's why it's so important. Thanks, that's all for me. So should we go to, to Juliet first of all, there with a the question about smaller co-ops and, uh, and the potential for better governance there. So I, I should answer the question rather than pose more questions. Is that correct? Hey, you can also ask if you have anything <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a great question. I think for me, the difference is um, the nature of the service, or in this case, it's a good, the photograph. Um, I think for the personal services, the smaller uh, context works well. And we're, we're already seeing that we have some domestic cleaning services, some healthcare nurses, and, and so forth. They're, they are forming quite small cooperatives. Um, for the stock photography, the virtue of a, a bigger one is that, you know, it allows them to claim a bigger market. And I think if they get 
small, it, it, it's sort of harder for them. It's a fairly monopolized market to begin with. So um, I agree that on the governance side, you're better off going smaller. I mean, not a thousand is not so large. Um, they are trying to do uh, some person to person interactions. So they have uh, funds for people to meet up. And if, uh, you know, when people are, photographers are traveling, which many of them often do for work, um, they get in touch with people in those locations, they're going and, and so forth. Um, I had a question for you, well, actually two. One is um, sort of what, what is the sort of scale of the, this, let's call it alternative or sort of democratic sector uh, in the Indian economy, and you know, is it is it sort of rising uh, to scale? And I guess the second part of that is particularly in an era when, you know, the economy has been opened up to these multinationals uh, who are, you know, in other places, of course, are growing and taking over more and more activity. So I'm kind of curious about the sort of at the macro level what the what the scale is. Um, and I, I guess for uh, Oliver, um, I'm curious about, uh, you know, in, in some of these areas, the sort of thinking, the imagination, the innovation, the sort of is outrunning the participation. So one of the things we found in our nonprofits was lots of enthusiasm uh, for these things in principle. You know, people love the ideas, the ideologies, the values, and then the, the scale didn't really keep up. And you know, one of our cases failed in the middle of the research. Another one, uh, you know, just had really low trading volume and so forth. So I'm sort of curious about. Um, I mean, we have our own theories of you know and explanations for that, but sort of how how much the uh, ideas are having you know volume of take up. I guess was that in relation to platform co-ops or mutual credit schemes? Yeah, or, or just the whole you know the. The, this whole field, I mean, as a whole, you know, you're working in, with a couple of different innovations. So kind of how you see it, you know, at, at, writ large in terms of the, the ideas versus the, in practice, how much uh, traction yeah. it's getting. It's a very good question. I'll, I'll answer briefly and pass you back to Ashish. But um, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it, it's a problem. A lot of people would aspire to a different type of economy and would really like that, but hey, money works it works really well you know we've spent a long time with all of our brilliant minds that we pay so well <clears throat> to work from investment banks um engineering a kind of financial economy which is designed to function very well and support its continuance so it's it's hard to break through it really is and um often cooperatives yeah do s struggle both for funding and for success especially economic success because they are competing in a, in a highly competitive market. Um, I think the best way is to sort of either to encourage them to succeed is for them to carve out their own niches, really, and to try and operate not as direct competitors. Um, but that's easier said than done. Um, and to Ashish's question about the honey, I think it's a beautiful and lovely example. I wouldn't actually class it as an example of mutual credit because presumably the people were still going to pay in conventional fiat currency. Um, so instead I would see it more as a model of pre-buying in that they pre-bought this honey, like you said, on the promise, the trust that it will be uh, delivered to them later. And that I think is another great example of an economic innovation which could be used to help finance a lot of the examples that Julia was mentioning and you know to to encourage more success in the sort of cooperative model mm. yeah thanks uh, and i think maybe the common part is the trust uh, and that's so 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 important for all our alternative models right that they're yeah uh, i mean uh, couch sharing for instance which unfortunately now has got uh, capitalistic, but uh, was so based on millions of people being able to go across the world and live in somebody else's house completely as strangers uh, without having problems um, and free. Uh, so trust was the sort of common currency in all of these. So that's, I think, why. Yeah, um, Juliet, so in terms of scale, it's very difficult to say uh, 
I would say that if you look at the producers that are involved, uh, the craftspeople, the farmers, the small scale manufacturing people and so on, it's in terms of the number of people and the number of people employed in the economy, it's probably the vast majority. Mm. But in terms of the uh, produce, if you look at it from a GDP point of view or the normal economic point of view, it's a, it's a, frac it's a small, much smaller part compared to the large scale industry and the large scale services and so on and so forth. And that's part of the inequality of the whole thing, right? So because it's like that, it gets ignored, it gets side, it gets marginalized and so on. And policies are mostly oriented towards the, the, big, um, the big financial share of the market. Is it rising or not? Um, I think it is because, I mean, it has been on severe declines, especially since 1991, when, when India opened up to the global economy, the so-called economic reforms. Uh, but in the last few years, it has, I think, become more, it is becoming more common, still marginal, but becoming more com common because people are realizing the problems with the dominant economy, uh, which is laying off people, which is automating, et cetera, et cetera. And secondly, now, especially with COVID, um, I think, and well, 2008, firstly, and then with COVID, I think more and more people realize that if we want to be relatively dignified in the way we're living, I mean, if you see the fact that 10 million people had to walk back home, uh, who are migrant laborers, uh, this is new global news, right? Walk back home because the government suddenly shut everything down. Many of them are saying, we don't want to go back to the cities. We don't want to go back to the industrial zones. We'd much rather do what we can in our own village. Now the ability, uh, sorry, the, the, the capacity doesn't exist, but if one can create the networking by which in fact people can learn or relearn how to live with the land or how to do small scale manufacturing, et cetera, and to even push policy direction in that, uh, in, in policies in that direction, I think uh, we would see a much bigger rise in this kind of a, uh, economy, but it's a big if. Uh, and I would say that my last comment here, I don't think the government is interested. I don't think this government is interested, even though our prime minister has been talking about self-reliance for the last two uh, month or so. I don't think they're truly interested. So it would have to be the communities, civil society, and a few of the state or provincial governments that are interested who can push this. Great, thank you, the three of you. Um, some, interesting, some interesting questions there. We've also got some questions in. I'd like to try and move now, if we can, to some of the questions in that have been coming thick and fast on the on the chat um we probably won't have time to get through all of them but fortunately there are some uh, some common threads uh coming up so if i could put this one to uh ollie first of all um we have uh, a few questions about the benefits and cost of centralization versus uh decentralization um i wonder if something that's that's something that uh, your experiences can can speak to a little bit, yeah. Um, I think this cuts back to the question that Ashish was asking of Juliet about the advantages of uh, you know large platform co-ops versus others. I mean, to my mind, yeah, you know, a model like Stocksy doesn't work if it's mini. If I'm looking for stock photography, I want to go on a website which has all the photos in the entire world so that I can search one catalog like that, bang. And I put this question to Brianna, the CEO of Stocksy, and said, you know, how do you feel about that? Wouldn't it be nicer to start lots of little mini co-ops all around the world where the people can meet each other and know each other? And she said, yeah, but you know, this isn't gonna work. Like we have to be pragmatic. So I think it comes down to the product that you're selling. If it's a digital product, then a platform co-op makes great sense and you can achieve great benefit through the scale of centralization. But if you're talking about something like food delivery, What's the point in centralizing that? You know, at the moment, the milk that I buy, uh, if I was to buy it from Tesco's, would be, you know, tr it's trucked halfway around Europe before it actually gets to me. I don't really want homogenized milk like that. I would much rather have milk from the most local cow that's treated the best. Um, so I think if you come down to, uh, yeah, the types of products that we can do locally, then those things really do need to all be decentralized in order to remove half of the environmental impact of their production and distribution. Um, and to, yeah, to, to actually fit with a kind of steady state or degrowth economy. 
Um, if we look towards a sort of bigger picture of can we scale that up to make it work for the whole of society, then I think you end up at the point of federation. So it's great if somebody designs a model for a bicycle food delivery business or a local food co-op, but there's no point in everybody in every village around the world trying to do that same thing. What we need to do is to share the lessons so and then federate those out. So there would be some advantages for, for example, a local food delivery system for having a centralized accounting system, which also did the accounts for all the other local food delivery systems in the in the world um, or in the country or at least in the region. Um, so depending on which aspect of the new economy you're talking about. I think centralization does make sense in many instances, but obviously where we're moving towards is a much more localized economy. Um, and I think that's what maps with the kind of degrowth agenda. That's great, thank you. Yes, and I'm, I'm, I'm also uh, inclined to point people as well to the idea of, of, of distributed as, a, as, an, as an alternative to both centralized and decentralized. And in the platform co-op world, that seems to be an idea gaining, gaining currency. Um, Juliet, if I can turn to you, uh, we've had quite a few questions on, on how to address uh, questions of global competition and efficiency uh, when we're talking about local cooperatives, uh, especially digital ones. Um, I wonder if you had any thoughts on, on that. Um, I get, I'm, I'm not sure, meaning competition with like the big global platforms or competition among platform co-ops? As in dealing with global competition, um, how can worker co-ops, uh, yeah, in, in global capitalism compete? I think there's, okay. there's a few questions that have touched on that theme. Yeah, so some of them are, um, you know, a lot of, I think where the platform co-op has, I mean, it has, possibilities in a lot of areas. I think in terms of the total numbers of people where it could really grow the most is in local services. So you're not necessarily competing against, I mean, this is a little bit like Oliver's point. You're not necessarily competing against a global. You might be like, uh, you know, in the United States, there's a company called The Maids. It's some like awful home cleaning company that pays lousy wages and the people all drive around in yellow cars. So there, there are alternatives to that that have been developed, which are local cooperatives of people who do house cleaning. So yes, they would be up against the maids. Um, and I think there, you know, the problem is that the maids is, the maids is gonna be, you know, offering a cheaper service because it's not paying benefits and it's paying minimum wages or whatever. So as long as you have kind of really dire labor markets and these alternatives haven't taken off that much, it is difficult. And that's, that's another tyranny of the market that co-ops, especially co small co-ops have to face. Um, and that's why I think, uh, you know, we've been talking today almost all, you know, because of the topic of the seminar about businesses and the sort of supply side. But I mean, if you, if you want a, an alternative economy, a degrowth economy that actually works, you also have to have things happening at the level of policy that enable it. So, and especially in the, in the period where it's a niche and it's just, you know, it's a small thing and it's trying to grow. So, I mean, I mean, this is something I know both from my, you know, training in economics, but also some of the research that I've, I've been involved in uh, publishing is, is, the, um, is the importance of government uh, initiatives that help people to survive without income from their businesses or their livelihoods. So whether it's minimum incomes, of course, we've had a lot of talk about a universal basic income, universal basic services, which I know are getting a lot of attention in the UK these days. So anything that allows uh, someone to, to kind of get their basic needs met, that then gives those cooperatives more ability to compete against the capitalist businesses. Um, I think it was Oliver who made the point about Uber subsidizing those rides at, at a huge subsidy in order to expand that market. Um, and 
you know, the co-ops just aren't going to be able to do that. But by, the way, point. It's not, by the way, it's not clear Uber can either. I mean, it is losing more money than I think any company in the history of the world. So yeah, sorry. I have to wait till the end of that story, I suppose, don't we? <laughs> to see how, how, how really viable that is. Um, can I just add a quick uh, yes, additional point do, to that? Uh, which is that, I mean, apart from the shifts that uh, Julius just spoke about uh, and Oliver, uh, I think it's also about a huge cultural shift in consumers no? or in consumption, let's say. So uh, the more we're able to actually instill in ourselves and, and in our fellow consumers uh, the ethics of what we are purchasing, whether it's a service or a good, the more we might tend to the smaller businesses than to, let's say, the maid, what is it called? Maids or whatever it is, the uh, yeah. service in the US. Um, or, and in fact, even for instance, if it gets known, like your research, uh, Juliet has shown that um, the photo stock company has such a huge inequality. Well, maybe as a person who wants to buy a photograph, I won't go there, but I might go to another stock company which actually has less inequality if i as a consumer uh, have had that cultural shift so i think it's really also about fundamental education awareness media uh, creating those cultural shifts i mean for instance with smoking uh, it's been such an incredible shift right uh, especially in 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 countries like the us and elsewhere where smokers now have to st sit in a small cubicle and smoke it's a cultural shift it ha it has happened despite the enormous economic clout of the of the cigarette and, and tobacco industry. So I think that's another piece of the puzzle that we need to really work on much more. I agree yeah, completely. Just, just um, Ali's point about, uh, Oliver's point about sharing customers was so interesting here. And I, we didn't get back to it, but um, I mean, that's where, you know, customers get kind of embedded in an ecosystem of businesses and providers that have those values and they become, um, you know, they, they change over time with that. But it, it's also the case that co uh, consumers have to be paid enough to be able to pay more for their um, products. And this is where in the U.S. we've gone in that reverse spiral you know, low wage workers who can then only afford to shop at Walmart, which, you know, gives more low wage workers who can then only, you got to go back up. Right. I, I wondered, there's, there's, there's a question here for uh, Ashish, if I could, um, quickly. I mean, we only have a little bit of time left and there was also a super interesting question that'd be great to put to all of you if we have time. Um, we'll see. We'll see how we get on. Ashish, the question was: uh, I know this relates closely to I think some of your more recent work. How do you balance plurality with universality in the context of uh, of the pluriverse? Very good question. Uh, this is something we grappled with, with when we did uh, when the five of us wrote, uh, edited Pluriverse, the book. Um, so in the introduction, we've actually looked at this enormous diversity of uh, radical alternatives from around the world. And then we've actually said that what seems to be common to many or all of them are these fundamental ethics of solidarity, uh, compassion, caring and sharing, diversity, uh, autonomy, freedom, et cetera. Um, and so we realized that there's a tension there, that we're talking about a pluriverse, but then we're also talking about some what potentially might be universal or common values. I think what's very important here is to understand that even as we think about these as common values, they get manifested, labeled, termed, and seen in very different ways in different parts of the world. Compassion could seem very different in my community, for instance, compared to your community. Uh, what we mean by diversity, what we mean by autonomy could be different. So even as there is some sort of a common thread there is also a pluriversity, a pluriversality in the way in which uh, ethics and principles and values are seen, reflected, manifested, practiced, worked out. So that's a bit of a way of resolving it, but we do recognize that there's a bit of a tension there. Unmute myself there. Uh... I don't know if we have time for one more question, but there's one really interesting one that's come through. If you had any closing remarks, maybe this could be a substitute for closing remarks, perhaps. Uh, the question is, 
would an only cooperatives economy automatically avoid economic growth and environmental destruction or is something additional needed? Great question. Um, I can leap on that one. So I don't think that co-ops are the complete uh, solution to anything. What that something else might be that's needed, I'm not entirely sure, but there's a definite case to be made that, for example, our railways and our buses, anything that deals with our infrastructure would be far better organized if it was cooperatively owned and governed. Whether that means that we would remove the growth imperative completely, I'm not so sure because it would be perfectly possible to set up a co-op whose objective of all of its members was to make as much money as possible. Um, so no, I don't think it is the final answer. I think it probably comes back to what Ashish has uh, so well pointed out uh, just then about the changes in the actual attitudes of people. You know, there was a recent survey here run by Positive Money, which asked people if they were more interested in the government pursuing economic growth or health and well-being. And the vast majority, I think it was over 70% of people said that it's actually it's time for the government to prioritize health and well-being of people. If that was to happen, and you know, there is obviously a groundswell of people now who are more interested in putting the health of people and planet before profit than ever before due to COVID. And I think it's that kind of fundamental cultural shift, which is probably the missing ingredient. That's great. Thank you, Oli. Juliet, I, don't, I know, I know you, uh, you may have to go soon. Uh, feel free to try and uh, uh, to yeah, answer. Well and yeah, I don't, I don't think that, you know, the co-op structure is operating at the level of the firm and the question is about the system as a whole. There's one way you could do it is if one of the principles of co-ops was that productivity growth was taken in the form of shorter hours of work, which is what I've been advocating for a long time. And then the co-ops don't grow, they just use progress to, um, to uh, give more leisure time. And so the more you put that principle into the system, it's also ecologically, you know, a very positive thing. I've, I've got a lot of research looking at the uh, association between shorter hours of work and uh, lower carbon emissions. Um, if you've got that built in, or at least partially, you really mitigate the growth pressures at the system as a whole. Great. Nashish. Yeah, maybe just to add, uh, I think uh, the word cooperatives is based on the word cooperative. And I think if we're talking about cooperating, not just with each other, but also with other species and the rest of nature, uh, then yes, it is the answer. But purely as an economic phenomenon, I agree with what uh, Oliver and Juliet said, that, no, that, that by itself is, is not enough. Um, uh, so yeah, I think... Uh, it's, it's one piece, one very important piece of the puzzle. The economic democracy part of it is partly addressed by that, but there's also all the political, the cultural, the social aspects, which are, and of course, fundamentally, the ecolog ecological aspects that also have to be uh, dealt with. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we are a little three minutes over, over time here. Um, I wondered if I just ask actually if we do have time for a closing statement. Uh, feel free, of course, to say to say no if that is the case. Uh, it's been a really great discussion up till now. Juliet, could we have a closing statement from you? Of course, if you have to go, please. No, no pressure at all there. It's uh, yeah, it's already up to you. No, actually, that call got uh, yes, that was cancelled. I'm fine. Oh, fantastic. Um, okay. <laughs> so, just listening to this last round of uh, comments uh, put me in mind of the fact that. In neoclassical or sort of mainstream conventional economics, the uh, it's everything is very simple. You just need more market, and more market gives you every other thing that you think is wonderful. Um, and so, I mean, it, it's that was a really simple message. Um, of course, it's dead wrong, but. Um, listening to this wonderful conversation today and, and these great questions, uh, you know, one of the things that is, you know, I think seems clear is that we understand that we have to work on many fronts and that in a, a, a system that we have, we are systems thinkers that in a system uh, you, although everything is interconnected, it, it also means you've got to change all the parts of it. And so, 
Ashish was just talking about culture, we've been talking about governance, we've been talking about economics. We're really talking about that sort of very multifaceted uh, uh, transformation. I, I would build on that entirely. Yeah, that's exactly my thoughts. To work at a systems level is so difficult that you have to break it down to constituent components. And that's what you mentioned there. We've been talking about economics and culture. We at the Open Co-op also talking about language. We think there's a big argument to say that the language that we've grown up in and with that we use is the language of neoliberal capitalism. And that if we're going to build a kind of network of commons based initiatives, then we need a new language. We almost need what's known as a new ontology or some kind of fundamental worldview, if you like, an axiom which underlies all of our actual thinking. And if you if you try and look back at what kind of the overarching axiom of today is, it's probably the Adam Smith model of homo economicus that believes you know competition is good and like you said more market share equals more profit that is the model that we've been born into that is the world view and it might be wise for us to take a step back and look at some of the fundamental assumptions that we make about our reality in order to form a new axiom a new world view which could possibly be something about the fact that we're all interconnected to nature and without nature we will not survive um if those subjects are something that you want to talk more about, that's exactly what we'll be doing on uh, two days on Thursday and Friday next week at the Open Co-op Conference, which you can find out about at open.coop. Thank you. And Ashish, a closing remark from you. Well, completely agreeing with uh, Juliet and Oliver, uh, just to maybe add, and I think uh, this is something that goes back to your very first um, statement uh, recognizing what's happening in the US right now is the need for all of us to also resist uh, in whatever way we can, whether it's resisting as a consumer, resisting out on the streets, uh, uh, resisting through whatever means we have or the kind of dominant system right now, which is so violent, so hegemonic, so uh, homogenizing. Um, and to ask us, constantly ask ourselves the question of what is it that really brings happiness and satisfaction? Is it just buying more and more and more and stuff, knowing what it's doing to the earth? Or is it having better social relationships, uh, the ability to be able to talk to each other like this online and hopefully soon face to face? Um, and, uh, and, and also just being content with what we have uh, within ourselves. So I think these are fundamental questions we'll have to really ask ourselves. We've gone so far away from what it is basically to be a human being or to be a life form that we really need these very fundamental systemic shifts that my colleagues have already talked about. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you uh, so much to the three of you for, for joining us today. We've had some, a real a big range of, of approaches to the idea of business in the degrowth economy. And uh, I think if there was a question posed about whether it's possible uh, to combine uh, business with degrowth, I think the answer has, has been a resounding yes, although it's, uh, it's not gonna be uh, an easy process of transition, but it seems like we are certainly some way uh, along, along the path there. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you everyone for watching us. Just one final plug here again, nodding to uh, our, our colleagues in Vienna. There is a, uh, a degrowth, conference that's been, degrowth conference that's been uh, happening earlier on this week uh, and they've put uh, some, some, a wealth of really amazing resources there online. You can find all of that in the description below. So thanks again to our speakers. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and uh, have a lovely evening or morning wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.